This morning's reading from the Word of God comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's start to read at the verse 8 of chapter 4. Verse 8. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then... Death worketh in us, but life in you. We, having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken, we also believe, and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. In this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven, if so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. We stop in our reading of the Word of God there. The Apostle speaks in verse 14 of chapter 4 that we know that he which raised up the Lord Jesus, and the implication, of course, is from the dead, shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. You have to realize that in the first part of this chapter, he's talking about the treasure of the knowledge of God that's put in him as an earthen vessel. That, verse 7 says that, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So he's making a distinction between himself and those who work with him 
and the Corinthians to whom he's bringing this gospel, this message. We will present us, he, Jesus will present us with you. And then in verses 17 and 18, the need to look not at the things which are seen, but that at the things which are not seen. And then we can see that our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And then in the truth expressed in the first eight verses, particularly of chapter 5, we desire to be clothed that we might not be found naked, clothed with that eternal house that is ours in heaven, in heaven, to be present with the Lord. All of these verses and many others that we're going to be looking at is used as the foundation for the biblical foundation for the truths expressed in the last two articles of our Apostles' Creed that are a part of Lord's Day 22. And again, the theme of the Catechism comes out in the first two words of each question. What comfort doth the resurrection of the body afford thee? That not only my soul after this life shall it be immediately taken up to Christ its head, but also in this my body, being raised by the power of Christ, shall be united with my soul and made like unto the glorious body of Christ. Then what comfort takest thou from the article of life everlasting? That since I now feel in my heart the beginning of eternal joy, after this life I shall inherit perfect salvation, which I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man to conceive, and that to praise God therein forever. The most familiar verse in the Bible to everybody in all the world is probably John 3, 16. And while the focus is often on the first part of that verse in the eyes of the world, we want to look at the whole of it. And in looking at the whole of it, we realize this. Whosoever believeth, that God, out of such love, gave his only begotten Son, and believe that that Son is divine. Whosoever believeth that God's Son is divine shall never perish, but has everlasting life. Not will have, but has it. So that the last verse in that chapter, verse 36, there John the Baptist says, He that believeth on the Son, literally in the Son, has, hath, everlasting life. That life is not something that will begin later. The very gift of faith the very, is evidence that we already have life. That life, beating, as it were, in our regenerated hearts. We've already begun to live forever. So we look, then at the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting, and the faith that holds those to be the truths of the Word of God. We want to consider something else first before we consider the resurrection of the body. Because the faith that holds that there is a resurrection of the body believes that there is also a resurrection of the soul. We've been talking about regeneration. That's the resurrection of the heart. 
As soon as one is born again, there's a resurrection, like unto is the power of Christ's resurrection, working in us to give us a resurrection of the heart. What we want to talk about in our first point is the resurrection of the soul. And then there's the resurrection of the body. And then there's our understanding of life everlasting. Resurrection of the soul is the faith that we have that as soon as, there, as the believer goes through the terrifying experience of having his body and soul separated and torn from each other, death, physical death, the separation of the body and soul, that as soon as that takes place, there is a resurrection of the soul. Described in the parable of Jesus of the rich man and Lazarus, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now notice the contrast. And the rich man also died and was buried. The emphasis. Sure, Lazarus' body was buried. But the beggar, the beggar was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. The more familiar words of Jesus to the repentant thief. Lord, remember me. Jesus answered, Today thou shalt be with me. Thou. They buried his body. But he would be with Jesus in paradise. That there is a resurrection of the soul is our conviction that the Bible assures us that immediately at death, God comes and he takes, as it were with angels, that soul. Heart is the center of it. The will and the mind, the spirit of man. And he gives it already to experience the life of glory. Heavenly glory. So that that soul can immediately experience the gain, Philippians 1, 21, of being with Jesus. The gain of being with Christ. Not wait. Not wait for the resurrection of the body. Not wait until Jesus returns. But immediate possession. So that as we sing that middle stanza of 202, Psalm 20, 73, verse 24. Thou shalt guide me by thy counsel, and as soon as my life is finished being guided by his counsel, thou wilt afterwards receive me to glory. No space in between. Life guided by his counsel, and then received with into unto him in glory. Glory. That's what we call the intermediate state. That language, intermediate state, is not from Scripture. The thought is, the concept is, but we use that those brief statement, that expression, two words, intermediate state, to refer to the experience of the soul of a believer from the moment of death physical death, until the Lord comes again and that soul is reunited with a resurrected body. This understanding of the intermediate state denies, one, the theory of annihilation. That as soon as there's death, we are no more. We don't have to worry about hell. We don't have to worry about anything else. After life. This Biblical concept shown by these passages of Scripture denies annihilation. It also denies soul sleep. That one is unconscious. You can't have gain, Philippians 1.21. You can't be with Jesus and be asleep. Unconscious 
until Jesus returns. It denies soul sleep. It also denies the theory of purgatory as taught by the Church of Rome. Purgatory is a place where believers still have to go in order to undergo more work in satisfying the justice of God. Our understanding of the, of the reason why there is immediate glory, immediate glory experienced by the child of God, is because of what we see to be the reality and the truth concerning the work of Christ. What do we believe about what Jesus did? We believe that his death made full and complete satisfaction for all of the sins of all of his people. And that therefore there is no reason for the child of God to have to suffer the consequences and the payment for any more of his sins. The payment by Christ is complete. There's no concept of purgatory, no reason for payment yet to be made. Jesus did it all. And so while death is often looked at as something that's frightening. Hebrews chapter 2 speaks of the fear of death in which we can live all our life long because it's an end of the experience that we have now and all the relationships that we have now. It's the end of things that are so familiar and, and it's the introduction of something that I hath not seen nor ear heard. We can't get it with earthly eyes and with earthly ears and with earthly minds. And so we anticipate. We believe it because we walk by faith, not by sight. And our faith takes a hold of that as a reality. But what it is and what it will be like, we can't get. Nevertheless, we take what the word describes concerning it. There's a beautiful expression that's used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The apostle, in order to comfort the believers who lost believing loved ones and who then feared wrongly because the time that Paul was in Thessalonica was very brief before he had to be chased out, before he was chased out, that the instruction that he gave was not complete. And so they feared that if a believer died before Christ returned, there was no hope. And so the apostle, in order to assuage that fear, gave instruction. And part of his instruction was that he spoke of those who died, believers who died, he spoke of them as asleep. Now there's where soul sleep takes it. They think they've got a biblical basis for it. But the expression soul sleep has to be, or the expression they are asleep, asleep in Jesus is literally the expression, is used by the apostle, one, in light of that fear that existed among the Thessalonian believers at that time. But secondly, the apostle used that expression because he wanted to emphasize Death is only temporary. We go to sleep with the anticipation of rising again. Sleep is just for a little while. So, look at death, and especially concerning the body, is only being for a little while. It's temporary. It's not permanent. It's not forever. By calling it asleep in Christ. He showed that to die is the rest. The rest that a believer physically gets through the gift of sleep. So there is rest in physical death. And he emphasizes it that way in order to point that out. And thus wants to remove the hurt and the fear and the sting of the death of their fellow believers who died before Christ returns. The scriptures emphasize this. 
And then we'll show some more verses. The scriptures emphasize this, that the moment of death does not separate or destroy or lessen the experience of a believer's with Christ. His experience with Christ is not decreased or destroyed. In fact, his experience of being with Jesus is intensified. Psalm 73 again. Christ did not come yet. They knew him as a Messiah that was to come. But then the psalmist says, and now we sing it in 203 and 202. What is heaven? What is the experience of heaven? Whom have I in heaven? Not my mother. Not my grandpa or my grandma. Whom have I in heaven? But thee, to whom my thoughts aspire. And having thee, having that relationship, what is there on earth that I could desire? You got him. Jesus to be with me in paradise. To be in Christ's presence. Take that eighth verse of 2 Corinthians 5. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from, from the body. And what, what's the opposite of being absent from the body? Look at the language. To be present with the Lord. When I, in righteousness at last, thy glorious face shall see. Psalm 16. So, there is a resurrection of the soul that precedes the resurrection of the body. That experience that ha we have of the soul being raised unto everlasting life in, in glory prior to Christ's return, but after the death of every believer, is fantastic, but imperfect. It's not full. It's not complete. The soul, though resurrected, craves justice, craves the judgment day. So Revelation chapter 6 describes the souls that are under the altar crying, How long, O Lord, before vengeance is executed on those who brought about our deaths? The souls, secondly, desire their bodies to be together again. Thirdly, the souls desire the rest of the body of Jesus Christ. They're not complete. The body's not full. And they long for that day. So, our faith in the resurrection of the body, as expressed in this 11th article of the Apostles' Creed, is a faith that also says there is a resurrection of the soul immediately at death. The resurrection of the body is our conviction that when Jesus comes again, when he comes again, he will bring about a beautiful and fantastic experience so that all that are in the grave will hear his voice and come forth. They that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation, but they that have done right, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life. John 5, 28 and 29. The hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. All that are in the graves shall hear his voice. That resurrection of the bodies equips 
the souls of unbelievers with bodies that will be able to endure damnation eternally. They will appear, to use the fig, Jesus parable in Matthew 25, as the goats that come to the left hand of the judgment seat. They that have done good, given the good that's been theirs in Christ's plan and counsel, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, their bodies will equip them with the ability to live, to live. That's interesting. What is it to live? What is life? I remember in 10th grade biology class, first day of the, of the first semester, biology teacher says, what is life? Discussed it for 20, 30 minutes, go home and write a paper. What is life? What is life? John 17, 3. It's not breathing. It's not a heart beating. Life is knowing God. Or more fully explained, it is knowing God's relationship with me. That I am not my own, but that I belong, body and soul, in this life and after this life, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. The resurrection of the body. The scriptures speak of it here in 1 2 Corinthians chapter 5 this way. We are presently in a body. But 2 Corinthians 5 calls it a tabernacle. That's a tent. So we're living in a physical body that is best described as a tent. But we look for, verse 2, a house, a building, something solid, something far more permanent. And then he switches the figure and he goes from being unclothed and we desire to have our tent removed, not so that we can be unclothed, but rather that we be, can be clothed upon. That mortality can be swallowed up with life. There's that life again. Knowing God's relationship with us and knowing that perfectly. So he describes that in verse 4. Not unclothed, but clothed upon. That mortality might be swallowed up of life. Philippians 3, verse 21. Philippians 3, 21. Jesus, when he comes, will change our vile bodies. And he'll change these vile bodies that they may be, may be made like unto his. First, Corinthians, First John 3, verse 1. We who are amazed at what it is to be loved by God. 1 John 3, 1. Know this. This is our hope. That he will come again and make us to have bodies like unto his most glorious body. Earthly eyes couldn't see it. Martha at the resurrection at the tomb, Peter, two travelers to Emmaus, the disciples in the upper room, the seven at the Sea of Galilee, the 500 that heard him and saw him, they didn't see that heavenly body yet because he made appearances so that their earthly eyes could see him because earthly eyes can't see the heavenly glorious body of Jesus Christ. So no human on earth has ever seen it yet. But he promises that that body that is his, when he ascended, he, he assumed that body 
then that is the goal that our bodies have now. God miraculously and graciously. I don't know if we can emphasize one adverb more than the other. Miraculously and graciously. He's going to take the dust. From the dust we came, to dust we return. He'll take all that dust, whether it's scattered with ashes, as some tried to deny the resurrection of the body, or not. He has the ability, miraculously and graciously, to take the dust, and out of the dust of my body, he'll make a new one. That's like Christ. In the familiar words of Romans chapter 8, in the middle of that chapter, we read of the fact that we, in this life, groan. We groan within ourselves. What do we groan for? Waiting for the adoption, to wit, that is, that's what to wit means, the redemption of our body. The redemption of our bodies is what we groan for. I don't know if we think of that very much. We are saved by hope. Hope that is seen is not hope. You've got it, it's a reality. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience, endurance, we wait for it. It's coming. The redemption of our bodies. We need our bodies in heaven as much as we need them on earth. God created man, body and soul together and that's how he will have us to be with him in glory fashioned fashioned body and soul to be able to have fellowship with God the great creator didn't have in mind our life here he had in mind our life with him in heaven. And in order to experience fully the glory that will be forever, he made us with what we have now. We must not think that what we have now is what we're going to be. No, this is the preparatory time. This is the working time. This is the preparation time. But we need body and soul then. And that's why we have both now. So we must not look, as the Greeks sometimes did, and others today yet, that the human body is a prison for the soul. And that we've got to get rid of this body. This body's evil. No, no, no. The curse has affected my body so that I have the lusts of the flesh that I always want to fulfill and satisfy. But the body itself is not evil. We can look for the redemption. It needs to be saved. And that's why our Lord Jesus Christ didn't just have a human soul, a human body too. He came with both, that He might redeem both our souls and our bodies. And so the language of 1 Corinthians 15 that speaks of the resurrection of the body emphasizes that. We look forward to that. Yes, we look forward. We're saved by hope. And there's where it is so easy for us 
to take the wonderful and nice things that God has given us to experience here on earth and to make them the end. I don't want heaven to come yet. I don't want everlasting life to come yet because there's things I want to experience and enjoy here on earth. There's relationships that I have that are so very, very wonderful. And we make them idols. We make them an end. And God says, I'm going to give you those relationships so that you can have a taste, a foretaste of what it will be. You don't want the pictures when you can have the reality. I don't need to look at the pictures of my wife and my children and my grandchildren when they're right there. Then I put the pictures away. I've got the reality. But when they're not there, then then I'm going to have pictures. Every relationship and every experience that we have now that is so absolutely wonderful is a picture. And because God in his wisdom makes it a picture, that is why we have to work so hard to make those pictures what they must be. The devil will spit on them. The devil will let dust gather on them. The devil will do everything he can to tear them up and to destroy them and to ruin those pictures. He will want us to throw them away, divorce them. But God says, The value of those pictures are what they picture. And therefore, there must be great diligence, haste, and eagerness to keep those pictures to be accurate reflections of that which will be. Blessedness of life. No real life. Blessedness of not having to work to remember the relationship that he's established with us. Because we'll have it. The experience of knowing him as we are known. Of tasting, seeing, as he tastes and sees us. A future perfection. That's life everlasting. But it consists of perfect covenant fellowship. Perfect enjoyment and communion with God and with Jesus. It's to be with him. We have a beginning of that now. You know what that beginning is? Pardon for sin. And a peace that endureth. That's the beginning of life everlasting. It's knowing that though I still sin, I am forgiven, pardoned for sin, that my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it right now, no more. It's gone. Pardon for sin, a peace that endureth, and a hope. A blessed hope for tomorrow. And that hope isn't 
Maybe it's a hope that is certain and a hope that is sure. That hope is strengthened by the promises that he makes. But given the sinful natures we have, so often that hope is strengthened more often by the struggles. So he takes a child. He takes a father. He takes a mate. He takes a parent. He lets our nature contaminate that picture and dirty it. And we thought it was going to be always so wonderful and so beautiful. And he teaches us work to keep it, work to fix it, work to clean it. But there's a day when it'll be perfect. Absolutely perfect. The Lord has provided good to me. His word, my hope, secures. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun will forbear to shine. But God, the God who calls me here below, shall forever be mine. Earth and heaven shall pass away. God will make all things new. Gone is the curse. And evil is banished. No more night. No more pain. No more tears. And no more crying again. And we will live in the light of the risen Lamb. The only good is to praise to Christ, our King. There's a room, a little room prepared for me where I will live with the Lamb eternally. And when this flesh and heart shall fail, and mortal life shall cease. I shall possess within the veil a life of joy and peace. And when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. When Christ shall come with a shout of acclamation and take me whole, then joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim, My God, how great thou art. Amen. Our Father, what joy shall fill my heart. The promises that thou hast given to us, to each, each one of thy children, of the glory, of the hope, 
that thou hast promised, to that we cling. We can't see it, but we hope. And we know that our hope shall not be ashamed. And then we say, what a day that will be. Come, come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. For Jesus' sake, amen.